it's kind of amazing to me that I can get so excited about teaching. I mean, it's kind of like, cool, let's get into the Word. <laughs> I mean, really. I don't know about you, what your day's like, but you know, I kind of get excited about getting together with people to share in the Word of God. It's like Jesus comes and sits inside me, really, and kind of takes over, and I kind of get all, ooh, guess what we get to do? We're going to do a video. <laughs> but you know, I even spend all day working on, you know, the technical details of, you know, like making web pages or blog sites and posting things to Facebook and social media. So that way I get the word out. But I don't really get the chance to record, you know. So I'm kind of like, you know, I get a little down, you know, and I'm going along in my week, you know, and then suddenly it's like, ooh, Wednesday's here. We get to do Romans. <laughs> Because if there ever was a book that's so much like America, it's Romans. And if there ever was a group of people that was so much like Americans, it's Romans. <laughs> yeah, we're Roman American, literally. And you know, that's kind of what I've been learning as I've been going through this book. We've been doing this intensely studying the Word of God because the intensity with which we're looking at the Word has taken us to very much a word by word, line upon line, study and and in grafting, so to speak, of putting the words themselves inside of us because they seem to fit. Seems to make very real the fact that when Paul was talking to the Romans, he was talking to you and me. And you know, when God was deciding to inspire Paul and then gives us his spirit so that we could understand it, then we know that the word coming to us is directly from God's mouth to your own ears. Because let the spirit give you ears to hear what he may say because we know that God is speaking today. So Father, I thank you that this is your word, that this is your way with which you guide us. This is the way with which you teach us. This is how you reveal to us Jesus. And God, I thank you that you have revealed your son to us, that he would be inside us, that he would be beside us, that he would be all about us by your spirit. Because without your Holy Spirit, we could not know Jesus. And without your Spirit, we could not have Jesus in us. So God, I thank you that in a way we don't understand, in a way we can't comprehend, you have made a way of salvation that we can make that appropriate to our lives so that we can come to you humbly asking you to teach us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. And you know, even when I pray, I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's really complicated. You know, you think about that. How do you ask God to come into your life? I mean, really, seriously. I mean, you've got to have faith in order to believe that God could come into your life. Well, i got one worse for you, because what we're going to study today, we're going to study something that makes no sense at all, but is a very real promise to you that God is in you. Yeah, it's here in the Word of God, seriously, in Romans. You didn't know that? Yeah, we're going to look at Romans chapter... Um, one, <laughs> we're moving right along really quick here. Zoom, we're zooming. Zoom, no Zumba workouts here. But uh, verse three is your promise that God can come into you. And you'll see how, because God, how he could do something like that, God only knows. <laughs> but God shows us in his word that not only is it possible, it's been done before. And because it's been done before, it can be done again. Yeah, we can do it again. Yeah, we can do it again. We once did it once. We once did it twice. Now we can do it again. Hey, we can do it again. Hey, hey. <laughs> no, but God, how he could come in the flesh. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but he did. And a lot of people kind of take that as like, well, you know, God possessed somebody. Well, no, not really. And when God is inside you, it's like you being possessed. Well, no, not really. You see, there's more to it than meets the eye. There's more to greeting this reading that we're going to see the Word of God reveal to us something about Jesus that is so awesome that we really don't want to run past it without getting into this because it's going to last us forever and ever and ever. And that is how God can come inside you. So let's look at Romans again. 
We're reading from the book of Romans, and we talked about Paul, that he was a servant. You know, and he wasn't a servant of man. He wasn't a servant of politics. He wasn't a servant of the government. He's not a servant of the church, but he's a servant of Jesus Christ. And that's interesting to us because we discovered that that meant that he serves Jesus directly. That he is led by Jesus and his spirit so that he would be in that relationship that he would have to be directed by God in order to do the things with which he did. And we know that he's a called to be an apostle, that he was separated in the gospel of God. And we've read in the book of Acts before where we know that even the church confirmed that. Now, it wasn't as though they decided that. No, God had already previously told Paul what he needed to do. But Paul wanted to submit himself to the church, so he wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. So he submitted himself to the church, and they likewise separated Paul and Barnabas to do the work that the Spirit of God told them to do. And so it's kind of interesting that also we see that God had a forepromise by the prophets through the Word of God that we know that things happen and that God does things because he tells us it's going to happen beforehand, which is what it says in verse 2 about promised things before they happen, so we would know that there was someone greater than we are that could actually have those things happen or know that those things were going to happen or make those things happen exactly as he says he would. And now we get to verse 3 and it says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, no, we're backing up. Hold those horses. There is something in that salutation that people think is just a greeting that, hey, there's something in there that's a little bit interesting. Look at verse 3 again. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. How could his son... Jesus Christ from God be of the seed of David according to the flesh. You see, God had to make the flesh to tabernacle the spirit of God that Jesus was. Because Jesus being that son of God, he was the physical representation of God to the entire universe. But he had to be made into the likeness of the seed of David. He had to, as we see, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed. Not created of the seed, not rearranged, not conceived, but made of the seed. And that's the thing that I want to get into with you to study about, about this made of the seed. Because a lot of times people make themselves out to be something they're not. You know, some people say they're great Bible teachers, or they say they're great pastors, and they may even say they're a great prophet, or a great elder, or a great deacon. And they make themselves into something that they want to be. But suddenly we read, and we watch, and we learn from them as we examine them, and we look at what the Word of God says, and we go, I don't think that's really what the Bible says. I think you're more of a self-made man than a God-made man. And that's a question that I want you to think about when we go through this study. Are you a self-made person? Or is God making you into a person that you have no idea what you're becoming? You see, that's what happened to Jesus. Jesus Christ, in verse 3, we're told, that was made of the seed of David. He could not have been conceived of the seed of David because Frankly, that would be kind of like a little perverted, you know, kind of like the Roman gods. They already knew what it was like to have Zeus come and have sexual intercourse with a woman. Oh, yeah, we know what gods can do. They can sleep with the daughters of men and bear the giants of old, as we read in Genesis 1. But that's not what the scripture says, and that's why Paul is making it very clear about made of the seed, not conceived of the seed. 
He's making a distinction that God alone can do. How could someone take something that's infinite and make it finite and then make it even limited to that limitations with which we, you and I know, because we're the seed of Adam, that we have uh, fallibilities that's like, you know, um, God would not have. Like, we could be killed. Ooh, can you kill God? No. Deicide. And yet, Jesus died. Oh. Whoa. So he was made of the seed of David, as we read in verse 3, according to the flesh. And that's what we're talking about. This flesh we live in is an outer garment. It's a outer housing. It's kind of like being a cup. You know, and you got to put something in it in order for the cup to be full. And some people are full of it, you know, and what they're full of is depending upon what they put in their cup. I know a lot of people that are, you know, full of politics. Well, you know, their cup runneth over with politics, or they're full of sports, you know, and they got that cup and you can drink from their waters, you know, and find out all about sports. Matter of fact, that's what their knowledge base is. A little shallow, but that's what they got. You know, a lot of interests are what you put inside you. You can take and choose what you use inside of you by what you see, by what you hear, by what you take inside, by what you identify and learn from. If you read a lot of pornography, you're going to put inside of you a lot of fleshy, kind of perverted or maybe distorted realities that aren't true. And that's what pornography does, is that it changes the image of the incorruptible to the image of corruptible man something man has made that he's corrupted from what God has intended. And what God intended was the beauty of creation to be exemplified with a man and a woman, and yet we take it and we call it sex. I don't know how you get sex out of creation, and I don't know how you put sex in creation. Frankly, I think it's disgusting, because if you really comprehended the joy of all the angels in heaven rejoicing over when God said, let there be male and female. Or when God breathes life into a living soul and becomes flesh and alive. Or when God made of the seed of David a tabernacle, a cup, a fleshy body for Jesus. Then it's amazing because we can't comprehend how something like that can occur. We come up with stupid ideas of our own, like evolution. That's kind of dumb. Or we come up with creation. That's kind of dumb, too. God said it. It became life. I mean, it's kind of like, it just doesn't make much sense to me if I'm sitting here in a physical plane, as a physical being, and then God says, life, and suddenly life exists. I can say it happened and have no problem with that. But as far as knowing how it happened, what it means and how it actually works, it ain't no way, Jack. I mean, come on now. Let's get real here. Let's talk turkey. You don't get it either. God spoke it. It happened. Boom. That's it. Now, if you believe that, then you could say, well, what's the problem with believing that he could protect you? Well, that's different. Really? If he created the universe, what did he do? Get exhausted and kick back and have to rest for the next 10,000 years? I don't think so. So we see here in Romans the very interesting thing that God made for the son of the seed of David according to the flesh a, you could say a presence or a body or a shape or a form that we recognize as being the son of man. So let me throw that out for you so you understand that. The son of man is the person who comes from man that is identified with man that realizes all the weaknesses of man and is able to make intercession because he understands what man is like so the son of man would be someone who we can say like hey you know what it's like and you could say to the son of man yes I do know what it's like I was the son of man now if I said to you son of God you don't have a clue what that means because you aren't a son of God at all. You're not angelic and you're not part of God or not God himself being the son. 
So, Jesus being the Son of Man, according to the flesh, we can identify with. Now, how he becomes the Son of God into the Son of Man, uh, what? Yeah. And that's what happened. And that's why it's interesting the way that Paul puts it. Made of the seed. What God has made, can't argue with. Try arguing with creation. You try changing creation any way you want to and see how well it works for you. It's going to go on. You try moving the stars, ain't going to happen. You try moving the sun, sorry, it won't work. You can try genetic manipulation. It still doesn't work the way you think it does, does it? No. As a matter of fact, eventually sometimes it goes back or it fails completely. And that's the difference between man-made and God-made. What God made for Jesus is in verse 3, according to the flesh, made him to be the Son of Man. Now, we as sons of men, sometimes we could be made into something according to the flesh. We could be made into something better than what we are. And in verse 4, it says, declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So, we'll study that later about the other part of what we're saying right now, and we might imply about it, but the fact is, what God made was to be able to take Jesus from where he's at in heaven to come to where we're at on earth and to be, according to the flesh, made of the seed of David. Well, why would he do that? Because <laughs> he loves you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it don't make no sense to me. Why would he go for do that for you? I mean, come on now. That's pretty stupid, isn't it? Here he was, God, creator, made everything, did everything, sees the sun and the moon and the stars and knows it all and holds it by his own countenance and holds it by his own might. And yet, God his Father made him into flesh. Made him into being according to the seed of David. Made him something that we could see something we could touch, something we could feel, something we could say, this is Jesus. This is the Son of Man. This is David's son. This is the son of Joseph. This is the son of Mary. This is a person we understand. We can hear him. We can see him. We can touch him. We can feel him. We can kiss him. We can hug him. We can fall at his feet. We can see him bleed. We can see him pardon expression, go to the bathroom. I mean, hey, you know, I always like to put reality checks in there every now and then. And, you know, my wife, you know, there's nothing like a good bowel movement to put everything in right perspective. So let's be real. Jesus did defecate, you know, and urinate, as well as everything else that was great about, you know, all of our life that we live. Because really, all of it is great. And God saw it all and it was good. It's not a curse to have bowel movements. If anything, it's a blessing. <laughs> for some of you anyways <laughs> some of you it's a curse oh well but the reality of being made of the seed of the flesh is that Jesus was completely human yeah I was laughing I heard somebody quote um, I think it was Joyce Myers they were trying to slam her for being a false teacher or some crazy thing and they said well she said that Jesus you know became flesh you know, I said, yeah, well, you know, and he gave up his Godhead, you know, and somehow he set it aside, you know, in order to become fully human. I said, well, yeah, well, he was still fully God. I said, well, you know, yeah, sort of, but, you know, he was technically really dependent upon the Holy Spirit because if he was anything more than God, I mean, anything more than flesh, you have no salvation because it would have been a God-man or a manly God or a godly man rather than just being a human being like you and I that knew no sin and did no sin and frankly would not have been dependent upon his father because he could have just like cruised it and snoozed it and not worried about anything. But he was tempted. And it even says that he had to endure suffering because that taught him patience and he had to learn things. How could God learn things? You see, that's what it means to be made of the seed of David. There's a lot here that you don't grasp unless you put it into practice of what you're looking at. Made of the seed of David means that Jesus was fully human, like you and me. If you would have stomped on that baby when it was born, it would have died. 
Sorry, yeah. The baby cried, yes. There was no miraculous kind of like, you know, well, wow, I'm just going to like levitate a bottle over here, you know, or go grab a boob, you know. I mean, no, that's not the way it works. Jesus was a normal human being, except he was sinless. And God watched over him and saw the baby grow, but he sent angels and warnings and messengers to have him leave the countryside because he was human and frail and fallible. In other words, he was tempted like we were tempted, and yet he sinned not where we would have sinned. So he even had worse of a temptation because he could have called upon rescue or help. How fast do we call for help? How fast do we reach for an excedrin? I reach fast for an excedrin, but how fast do we need help? We're always wanting something more than to trust in the Lord. And Jesus had to trust in the Lord for his humanity as well as his deity. It's a little weird, but that's what it means to be made of the seed of David. He had to give up something or set aside or somehow place outside of his control the very nature of who he is, which is God, the Son of God. How? I don't know. It says right there, made by the seed of David, or made as into the seed of David. And if we looked at verse... Well, eventually it's going to, Paul does run on senses, but eventually he realized God the Father did it. You know, it's like God prepared a body for him. You know, thou hast prepared a body for me, you know, it says in Hebrews, you know, and that. The best way to look at it that I've ever tied, tried to teach people about trying to comprehend, particularly for Americans, especially because we're Roman Americans and we're American Romans, you know, and we're kind of like, you know, messed up in our Greek thought, is that think of it as camping, you know. When you go camping, you live in a tent instead of your house. Well, that's kind of what Jesus did. He left his house in heaven and he came and went camping here on earth. And while he was camping here on earth, he had a tent. And while he was in that tent, that's what he looked like. Now, once the tent, you know, had been perished, then it was gone and that's kind of what's left behind is the tent. Ohalecha is the word for tent, but we have a song that says, Matohu Ohalecha Yaakov Mishkanotecha Israel. It's, Behold how good and how pleasant it is are thy dwelling places, O Israel, or Jacob, you know. And dwelling places are tents. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places. God chose to dwell in a tent among us. He came into the tabernacle of his own making by way of God, his Father, preparing that tabernacle for him to live in, that tent for him to live in, that ohalecha, that made by the made to be of the seed of David, that was made ready so that he could occupy it while he was here. When he was gone, it was gone. And it perished, eventually. But you see, it didn't really perish, it was changed back into the image of the incorruptible God because it was sinful flesh that became gone and it didn't go back to the dust because it came from wherever God created it from. So where it went is kind of an interesting mystery because it still bears the cross and still bears the crucifixion and still bears the marks today. So the flesh you see will be the flesh you know. And that's kind of sad in one way. You'll figure that out someday. But the reality of Jesus being human is something that sometimes gets forgotten about how human we are and then how human he was. So we want to comprehend that so that we understand when he is coming to tabernacle with us, when he's coming to live with us, when he's coming down into becoming the very physical manifestation of God in the flesh, that can't be. It's a it's a dichotomy. It's a I can't think of the word. You know, it's it's a, a par paradox. It's a paradox. It makes no sense at all. It is not it is contrary to the laws of our world, but it was perfect according to the laws of a greater dimensional reality that exists beyond what we can see, touch, and feel. So the law of precedent applies that the greater came down into the lesser as it manifested itself in the finite because we could not see the infinite. It's a kind of a quantum physics thing, but <laughs> well, you get to play with QP. You know. Wow, quantum physics, man. Where did I come up with that? But no, the fact and reality is is that there's dimensions all about us. You know, the dimension that you look at, you know, one dimensional is kind of like that if you could look at the edge of it. Two dimensional is you can see the edge and you can see this. 
height and depth, you know, and then three dimensional would be kind of like, you know, you can see like, you know, three dimensions kind of like, you know, you got height, depth, and space, you know, and four dimensions gets into, you know, kind of like, you know, time and elements, and there's actually, I think, I forget how many dimensions there were, you know, I, um, Nachmanides, I believe, in Genesis, studied the book of Genesis and developed how many dimensions there are just by studying the book of Genesis. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> Quite a mathematician. You know, technically they say everything boils down to math, but I don't know. One of the Missler studies talks about that, and it's interesting because it's true. I mean, I, I found it in Jewish culture, you know, Jewish teaching, you know, is that, yeah, Nachmanides, it's like, for Jews, it's like, no big deal, of course there's more than one dimension. What are you, stupid? You know, you can see there's at least three, so if there's three, there's got to be more. I mean, and that's the way some Jewish thought is, is that, well, you, then you project out how many it could be, and then you get to a certain reality that, based upon quantum physics, becomes a numerical equation that you can limit it in the end to what we can deal with, and then beyond that, quantum would be gone, because even that, as Einstein proved, brings you to a reality of because this is order and it's not chaos there must be creator so that makes God and so the reality of kind of all of this is kind of like how because there's a creator made of the seed of David made to be man Jesus God comes down becomes man and he is a God made become man told you there's two parts of this. What kind of man are you? Yeah, I know. You're a self-made man. That's right. Yeah, you, come on, we'll talk. Let's get real. You made yourself after your own image. Or maybe the image of your father that, you know, kind of like tried to tell you what to do when you were growing up. Which you probably didn't have a father because most people today don't have any fathers. They have a bunch of kids growing up trying to act like kids as adults. As a matter of fact, one of the most disgusting things I can think of is that, you know, you see a man playing a game on an Xbox. Don't get me wrong, I played Warcraft, so I do know what they're talking about. I know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> yeah, I was in Warcraft for a little while. You know, it was like, I finally had to get myself away from that. It's like, you know, that's what a waste of time. It was a fun waste of time, but, you know, when you're disabled, you know, you get a chance to kind of like, you know, deal with certain things. And, you know, sometimes distraction is a good thing. Sometimes obsession is a bad thing. But a self-made man is a person who takes his own input, fills himself up with what he chooses to put inside himself. Now remember, the God-made man was that here was a vessel that was already in existence. God came down and literally occupied the tabernacle. He came from his house into the tent, and while he was with us, he tabernacled with us, and then he went back to his house in heaven to make a place of permanent structure for us. And that's why we will take this tabernacle we're living in and get rid of it and get our house and get a better, you could say a better suit, to wear you know, when we go home to be where he is at. But being a self-made man, the interesting thing is we have made ourselves and filled ourselves with a lot of hunk of junk inside. We have grown up in some ways with a lot of stuff that we were told is what really life is all about. You know, get a good job, get a good wife, get good kids, watch football, watch baseball, watch golf, watch basketball, be violent, you know, defend your family, fight for your country, serve, be, you know, loyal, be, oh yeah, upstanding, you know, and die for those that, you know, you, to protect them, you die, yeah. Die for them? I don't think so. <laughs> In a way, yeah. I mean, the bad part is that these Romans would die for their country. I mean, they would salute and die and fall on their own sword even. You want me to do what? Die, drive on your sword. Okay. I hope the afterlife is better than the forelife because... And the Romans would do that. They'd fall on their swords. Stupid. But they obeyed orders. That's kind of like what Americans do nowadays, you know? They kind of like get this dumb idea of what they put inside them growing up super patriotic because of 9-11, now they're super patriots, and they think that, oh, well, you know, it's okay to go take orders and go kill people and go do things, you know, violently, because after all, 
hey, we're not getting ready for Armageddon. We're not getting ready to go be, you know, unmade men, because that's what's going to happen in the Valley of Megiddo, is that the self-made man and the God-made man, when they get together in the Valley of Megiddo, guess what? God's going to say, you are unmade. And that's what's going to happen, is cells are going to fly apart. God's going to say, peace, and poof, everything goes flying apart. If you don't think so, read the scriptures. It says that in the Valley of Megiddo, that a horse's bridle, that blood would come up to a horse's bridle. Now, you can figure out for me, if you want to, if you've ever been to Megiddo, take one look from one end of it, which you really kind of have a hard time doing, and go ahead and look all the way across that valley, which is not a narrow valley. It's kind of like an open flatland. But it's kind of deep, you know, if you got up on the hillsides, you know, around it. And you can see that there's a bowl there, kind of. And you got to imagine that that bowl is going to be like one long lake, a lake full of blood. Now, how are you going to get the blood to stay in the lake without it kind of running off or falling down so that it could be measured up to a horse's bridle? How are you going to do that? I mean, is it going to be like thermonuclear bomb? Or, you know, like we're going to have like the biggest, baddest, you know, machine guns ever? Or there's going to be so many armies that, you know, it's just going to all be a slaughterhouse, you know, and everybody's going to be shooting everybody and everybody killing everybody that just enough blood's going to kind of fill up. No. That's not how it goes. Did you know that 80% of your body is water? And of that water, probably 65 to 75% of it's blood. So when your body goes, poof, unmade, when Jesus says, peace, and you're violent, poof, your atoms fly apart, and guess what's left? Your blood. Ooh. so that the word of God would be fulfilled the king of kings and the lord of lords who comes as a prince of peace comes riding in to the valley of Megiddo to make war and to do war and it does say that he has blood the blood from you know, splashes on him you could say it's a little sicker than that but the fact of the matter is, is he says be still or shalom aleichem peace be still Kind of like what he said on the waves when he's out on the boat, you know, and the disciples were terrified, saying, Oh, don't you care about us? We're perishing. And Jesus gets up from the boat and says, Peace, be still. Same thing in the Valley of Megiddo. He's not going to do anything like kill people or take the sword or kind of kill anyone. He's just going to say a word. And people come undone. They'll be unmade. And then the blood will be there. And it will, poof, flesh falls apart, flies apart. And all the blood of those that were there, or there that rebelled against God will fill up. And that's all that's left back from that valley. It will be a baptism of blood. Kind of like a bloody mess. Kind of like the birth pangs of a new nation. The birth pangs of a, of a, you could say, a, a afterbirth. You know, that the nation is about to be born. The new age is about to begin. So... The baptism of it, the new mikvah, will be of the blood of Megiddo that goes up to a horse's bridle. Yeah, kind of sad for the nation. Kind of sad for creation. Kind of sad for what you look around. You don't realize that the mountains, the trees, and all of creation does groan and travail waiting for the revelation of the sons of God because they're under a curse. So how could they groan if they don't have some type of ability to understand, comprehend, and to be a part of knowing God? because God made them. And so you see, there's an interesting thing about when God makes something. In essence, it's not that God is in everything. No, but there's a knowledge of God in everything. Everything has that limited knowledge of God in some way. The trees clap their hands, plants reach up. Oh yeah, it's reaching to the Son of Righteousness, rising with healing in His wings. So, being a self-made man, what do you think about being made after being unmade, I mean, you know, we, we went to what the end is, and you sure don't want to go there, do you? I mean, do you really want to go to Megiddo? Well, then, you know, what are you doing in the Army? What are you doing in the Marines or the Air Force or the Coast Guard or serving your country? Why are you pledging allegiance to a flag to march into hell? I mean, are you trying to be Don Quixote? <laughs> okay. The fact of it is, we are made into the likeness of the Son of God. See, we start off as the seed of David, so to speak, that's moving towards becoming the seed of God. The literal 
Word of God being made alive in us that grows us up into becoming trees of righteousness, becoming plantings of the Lord, becoming sons and daughters of God. We are made into His likeness. After He, in verse 3, was made into our likeness. He, on the cross, became sin for us. And because He became exactly our likeness, he embodied all of sin for all of eternity. Because he was going to remove sin from the universe. Not just from creation, but from the heavens above and the earth below. Because Colossians says he reconciled everything unto himself in his own body by the blood of the cross. So on that cross, by his blood, he was able to take heaven and earth put them together and nail them in his own flesh and bring them into one moment in time when all of it's held together by a nail and a cross and a God who's dying as the Son of Man because he was made into sin for you. That's the God-made man. But God didn't leave him there. You see, God accepted that because he was making reconciliation. He was bringing it together so that there would be a removal of sin from having an effect on us. There was that ability that God was going to do in order to be making that kingdom that would come, that would be for his son, that concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. God didn't raise himself, really, but God raised Jesus from the dead. So it's kind of like a mixture metaphor there, but still, the point being is the spirit of God raised him from the dead. Jesus didn't do it himself because he was human. But he was God, and he was human, and he was God, and he was human, and he was God. They play with that and argue about that a lot. But being a God-made from heaven in his house down to his tabernacle we have a tabernacle we're in that we want to go to his house we want to be a god made man like in him because we already know what happened to the man the god made man who was made likened unto us because he lived with us for three and a half years he lived longer than that but for ministry he lived with us three and a half years when we noticed him and then he died because he became sin for us but that wasn't the end of the story the God-made man was raised from the dead by God. That gives us great hope because that means that what God has made in putting God in the flesh for a purpose, God can take God and put him in your flesh for a purpose. You see, God can come inside you and live in you. God can become flesh. God can become inside you and be taking your sin. God has removed your sin from you. If you can receive it inside that God himself lives in you, that God wants to come to you, that God wants to bless you, that God wants you to know that he is made for you salvation and his name is salvation of God. That he has become the salvation of your soul and your spirit. To come into a place where you could know God personally, then you realize that you don't want to be a self-made man. You want to be a God-made man. And God made his son to become man so that God could make you into having his son in you so that you would become a God-made man. Would you become that God-made man? Would you choose to use your life for the purpose of his will? To no longer sin? To no longer fear death? To no longer have that frustration and aggravation? that you have because sin is affecting you and so many things are directing you in different ways because you have so much junk inside that you weren't like the empty tent waiting for God to come inhabit but you're really a tent that's full of a lot of junk that you need some spring cleaning and you don't know how to get rid of it and you don't know what to do with it and you know it doesn't apply anymore but somehow you stuffed all that stuff in your tent and you got it around because you used it when you were doing it, when you were running around the town, when you were enjoying your life, when you were participating in sin, when you were doing every other thing that you were told by the world in its ways that it's the way you become a man. 
because you are a self made man and you are working according to the plan that you have seen others do and after all hey who's gonna argue with you God is God came down for you that's it pure and simple the God made man and the self made man are at conflict I'm a God made man God is making me into the image of his son but I'm also a self made man because I made myself out to be who I am I made myself out to be what I am I have made myself to wear clothes to act in a certain way and behavior and I find myself in conflict with the God made man in me and the self made man that I am that I am frustrated by the aggravations that come into conflict who can rescue me from these things Jesus can because <laughs> he is become sin for me he knows he understands he goes I got it and he says you don't get it because I am the God made man I am the self made man I chose to become you and die for you I became flesh so that I could become sin so that I could remove it until the very end when in reality of life I will present you before my father I will bring you to my house I will show you my kingdom I will lift you up into the heavenlies where you can rejoice forevermore and we can be glad and have that joy of the spirit because I know what it's like to be a self-made man because I came down and I lived with you and I tabernacled and I dwelt as the seed of David among you. O seed of Abraham, O seed of Adam, O seed of Gentile, O Roman that you are, O Gentile, O Jew, O man, O woman. You are someone who is just simply a person who lives inside of a tent. You have been made by the world, you've been made by your parents, you've been made by society, You've been made by Christianity, you've been made by Protestantism, by Evangelicalism, by lots of people all around you. But has God made you? Really? I mean, can you say today that God made you who you are? That God spoke to you and said, Hey, come here. I got a secret. I'm working it out. I got you covered. Come on. Follow me. I'll show you a better way. I'll show you I'll show you how to do these things but I'll show you how to do them in a more excellent way so that you kind of you kind of enjoy it along the way you don't have to struggle so hard you don't have to get beat up you don't have to get stomped on there's a better way I can show you a better way because I did it I lived it I was able to because I asked God to help me I asked my father to give me a spirit and he did and he filled me and I want you to be the same way I want you to live according to my father I want you to understand what my father has done for me I want you to have the same things I had and live the same way I live and if you do these things if you participate in these things if you ask I will give them to you you just have to follow me because if you don't follow me you'll stumble if you don't follow me you'll grumble if you don't follow me you'll go out on your own and make yourself out to be something you're not when I can see inside your heart what you really need is me and I'm willing to come so self-made man do you want to be God made? all I gotta say is go that's all you gotta do you just go to him wherever you are however you are whatever you are and whatever you're doing it's pretty clear God is the one who's doing everything it's a fact whether you participate with him or you're left behind whether you get in program with what he's doing or whether you decide that you're gonna argue with him all the days of your life God is reaching out to you and calling you and he wants you to know in a very real way he'll make you into his son he will conform you into the image and create in you in some way Jesus so that you can live today and say I no longer live but Christ liveth in me the life that I now live I live by the will of the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me it is no longer I that liveth but Christ who liveth in me I know because I was a self-made man 
and God had to undo me through great suffering and great misery, through great physical turmoil, through great devastation to my soul, to my spirit, and to my flesh. He had to kill me so that I could be resurrected again unto Him. And He had to do it more than once. So I don't know how long it's going to take you to get with the program. I don't know how long it's going to take you to understand, as it says in verse 3, that uh, concerning His Son, concerning you, concerning your salvation, concerning your place, God made you and God is going to make you one way or another. You're either going to become the seed of David or the seed of man. And if you're Satan's seed, you'll find yourself with Satan. Or if you're the seed of man, you'll find yourself falling into that place of Megiddo where you're unmade and you're an unmade man. But if you find yourself wanting to be God-made, and all you got to do is let him do it, don't you? Let God make you. Because you can't do it yourself. You can't help him to do it. You can't, like, you know, kvetch or, you know, kind of add a little here and add a little there, you know, and kind of manipulate your way. Because you keep working it and trying it, and it won't work that way. God will take all of you, or he'll take none of you. Because he'll step back and let you keep playing your games, working it out your way. Or you could today just say, I give up. And God says, thank you, and loves on you. Father, I thank you that you've given us your word, that we can just give up, that we could let go, that we could be still, that we could relax and enjoy the ride, that we don't have to work so hard at trying to find out what you want, because you're already doing what you want. We're sometimes just in your way. So God... Help us today, really, to let go, to be still, but to see you more than what we see in ourselves. Help us not to look in the mirror as a self-made man, but help us to see in the eyes of others as they begin to witness to us or they begin to see in us changes and things that have made a difference, that we're shocked that we're now becoming a God-made man, that you have promise that that which you have begun a good work in us, you will complete unto the day of salvation. And though we may not see ourselves as God made, you have already started the work. And just like you promised, you will finish it. Because, after all, it's impossible for God to come in the flesh. And only a God could do that. And you did. And it's impossible that a God could die on the cross. And only a God could do that. And you did. And it's impossible that a dead God could be raised from the dead and live forevermore, and yet you did that because you're God. And it's impossible that sin could be completely removed and yet still be alive and working in me, and yet I could be forgiven. And yet, because I'm God-made, you have taken care of that because you have forgiven me. So God, I thank you that I'm a God-made man, and I pray for those that are listening and watching that you would make them to understand what you have done, only you could do. And what we can do is only to let go, to let you, and to watch and see what you can do when we give you all of our life and we hold back nothing in our life from you. Jesus, thank you for being that God-made man that saved me from myself and that saved the world from itself. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? God did it. I mean, I just got, I just got, I just get a kick out of that. God did it. It's like, what do you do? He saved me. Oh <laughs> well, wow, what a kick in the head. God saved me. I didn't do it. You know, I mean, people always ask me, you know, did you get delivered from drugs? No. Did you get delivered from no? Did you no? What do you? He just saved me. I don't know. Sorry, he just, just saved me. I was like, I just get a kick out of that. He saved me. Isn't that wonderful? Enjoy what God has given you. Employ the joy of the Lord that God wants you to have, and you'll find for yourself the intensity with which he wants us to know that though you be a Roman, though you be an American, you can have, as Paul was inspired to write these things, 
the very will and the very knowledge of the Word of God working in you to accomplish His purpose as God makes you into what He wants you to be as you become a God-made man.